Expressive Voice, and today you're going to be very much delighted that we have back on NPV for Progressive Talk Podcast number 22, David D. Welcome back, David. Hey, Josh. Nice it's to be been, back. Yeah, it's been a while since we've last had our meeting of the minds, so I'm extremely delighted to have you here today again. So some of the topics that we'll be discussing will include Biden and Trump in re- relationship to why it's important we get Trump out. Also highlighting how the left can start winning by discussing how the left social media is its own worst enemy. Uh, Biden's plan, some of his um, history, good and bad, as well as some of his policies, how the mis- uh, left is miscalculated accelerationism being the strategy. And we'll also dive in a little bit about Antifa, Portland, and Social Security, and harm reduction. So, Dave, let's start right in. I want to go back first, and we'll just move forward, and then we'll talk about current affairs at near the end. Mm-hmm. This uh, understanding of accelerationism that we saw that was birthed back in 2015, 16, you know, Bernie or bust, Yang or bust, whatever or bust, just get Trump in, he'll accelerate everything, everything will unravel, the DNC will wake up and they'll realize they'll need us, so forth and so on. What are your thoughts on what we've seen evidence-wise or otherwise about that particular theory? Yeah, that, oh. I mean, that's just it's one of those things to me that sounds good in theory. It it almost sounds comforting, like, oh, okay, yes, this this Trump administration will come to an end quicker. Oh, my God, I love the sound of this. Uh, This sounds like a wonderful idea in theory. But in actuality, it's going to do so much damage to the people the left purport to want to protect the most vulnerable among us whether it be senior citizens losing their benefits or the disabled or minority groups or these these vulnerable populations of Americans would be crushed during this process. And then we're just supposed to expect this like magical rebuilding upon that destruction. Uh, It's not well thought out. It doesn't it doesn't connect out of theory. Implementation sounds dangerous. It sounds reckless, short-sighted, and as someone who's on the left, I don't agree with it at all. I agree with reform. I agree with protecting vulnerable populations of people at all costs, and I just – I'm so far from that theory. Mm -hmm. So those are just my general takes. What's your take on accelerationism? Yeah, I'm in agreement with you. I think it is very volatile and uh, potentially risky and dangerous, as we've seen with Trump's election, his handling of the COVID-19. He doesn't believe in climate change. He's turned back a number of progressive uh, policies that we have succeeded in implementing, and he's overturned those. And now, of course, the Supreme Court justices may end up uh, six to three. Uh, in favor of the radical right. And then you're also seeing the increase in divisive rhetoric, uh, rise of fascism and racism in America. I think that this whole idea, like you said, that the way to go about it, we don't have any historical precedents for that having ever happened. As Vosch says, give me one example of where progressive policy or revolution happened out of fascism. There is none, okay? Um, so it's extremely, extremely dangerous. Uh, what are your thoughts about people who say, but Dave, I want to vote principle and I want to go third party because we need to get someone in there that really cares about everything we, that we care about. And we've been waiting too long. So I'm going to fight tooth and nail and I'm going to take the principle stand. What would you say, uh, to those, uh, block of people in that approach? Well, well, as one of those people, like I've been in that position where I have taken a stand for, uh, you know, uh, whatever party, in spite of this rigged two party system, I've said, you know what, I like them, I'm going to vote for them in spite of anything else. Um, But like we've just been discussing here, 
all the things we've been mentioning about how the bottom is falling through the floor in our political system uh, to to risk enabling Donald Trump getting a second term. Because we have to understand this is a rigged two-party system. Whether we want to deal with that or not, I don't care. I know it is, and we have to deal with that. Um, so I would forego the integrity vote, even though I've done it before, even though I've, I have voted green, I have voted libertarian, I have voted independent. Um, not now and not until there is reforms that progressives can get through Congress and hopefully signed by a president that will allow third parties to flourish in our system because they you know they don't have a chance they can't get ballot access you know funding it, it, it's hard to get funding this the deck is stacked against third parties to get anywhere and it's nothing more than an integrity vote that enables trump like that's not an opinion that's a fact <laughs> in my world anyway yeah, I'm not for the third party vote this election cycle. There's too much at stake right now. Um, but 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 there is a, there's a, there's a question here about can we vote for Biden and can we also like accelerate a little bit in the other direction, like having a general strike? So we can have it both ways in in a way. Like I'm going to vote for Biden, but I also I'm also voting for a general strike. Uh, I'm also voting, uh, not voting, but I, I, I'm promoting direct action. Right, right. I, I'm not stopping at a Biden vote. Biden isn't some end point. Like, I think a lot of lefties just think, oh, you're going to vote for Biden. Hope it's all going to change. No, that's where the work begins. Exactly. Exactly. Agree with that. You know, it's multi-pronged. Uh, you know, we don't just go in and vote Biden. That's it. That's not at mm -hmm. all, um, you know, the logic. Uh, that we're discussing. And you, you're absolutely right in saying that election reform is going to be necessary for a third party on a national level to ever be considered viable, whether it be governor, senator, most importantly, president. Uh, that's just, uh, you know, because they struggle with even getting on all the ballots. Like you said, they, they don't have funding. They've got to reach 15 percent to get on national debates, which, the, you know, even Joe Stein, as popular as she was in 2016, couldn't muster ever getting over three or four percent uh, in polling. Uh, so the fact is Howie is just not going to be able to do that short of a miracle. Uh, and they've been trying, you know, third parties been trying for decades uh, to try to get in and they just are not able to do that. The best we saw is the reform party with Clinton, you know, and Bush, uh, but that didn't work out. And so I, I'm total in agreement with you on on that that front. And again, I want to emphasize this is not about shaming anyone. This is about trying to be real and honest about results, because I think what I've come to appreciate, you know, because I voted Stein in 2016 along the pathway is that principles without results is really not principled at all. It's just feels it's a feel good vote and it doesn't really ultimately lead to the outcomes. And in fact, I would argue leads to the opposite of what you're trying to achieve. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. I think you're trying to uh, uh, summon a, a Vosh quote there. And I'm glad you brought up Vosh because I've gotten into Vosh lately. Uh, I subscribed to his YouTube channel. I totally recommend that people do. Um, it's a, just like good lefty takes. And I think he said something along the lines of, I care more about unprincipled winning than principled losing. Because he talks about how the fascist, like, you know, they coalesce, the right coalesces. They don't bicker with one another. When it, when it comes down to crunch time and it's time to vote, they all coalesce. They don't care. They drop their values. They drop their principles and they back whoever it is and they win that way. Where the left just wants to bicker, we want to hash it out, we want to say no, we want to, you know, dissent, 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 constantly dissent against each other. They're coalescing while we're dissenting. Uh, so the, the concept of unprincipled winning was, was, a, was a great concept that uh, Vosh brought up. And I just think a lot of people, a lot of people on the left need to hear that because it is much better 
<laughs> to have unprincipled winning right now than principled losing. Particularly in a world that we are in that is so corrupt that it's like bringing a butter knife to a gunfight, right? <laughs> and I would argue principles with results is ultimately principled you know like uh, so i would even i'll go a step further from vosh and say that being real about where the fight is and adjusting accordingly is far more principled than living in la la land as some idealism space that just as feels good and but is not in any way grounded in realism so right Definitely the the bottom take on that is the miscalculation of the left about accelerationism, about how we strategize uh, to get toward our goals. Uh, but that brings up the discussion around uh, how we truly weld power toward our progressive agenda. How do we sort of segue from this um, left social media being dominated by criticizing the DNC and they can only do evil? There's no nuanced discussion about the good and the bad that Obama Biden did and this whole like accelerationism. How can we sort of segue into a different discussion that is ultimately going to be far more productive? Well, it's kind of like what I brought up earlier. It has to be we have to be looking at both both paths. OK, the, the, the path to work within the establishment and the path to hedge forward on a new path, one that could entail direct action like we've never taken uh, before. Like, for example, um, getting into the streets peacefully, protesting for Medicare for all. Um, but we <laughs> we just can't throw it all away. I know the DNC is horrible. I know the Democrats are horrible. I know we have so many problems with the establishment, but for the time being, we have to work within the system and we have to hedge that new path at the same time. So like I was saying, Biden isn't the end point. Biden is the one path we have to work with and we have to blaze that other path at the same time through via direct action. So once again, it's back to the multi-prong approach there's some nuance here. It's not a black and white situation. Like I know those are more preferred and we're all, you know, they're, they're just easy to warm up to. Uh, uh, but lefties have to understand we have infiltrated the system. We have the Justice Democrats. We have Bernie Sanders seeding the future. Uh, we have the, we have a monopoly on on all the good ideas right now, whether it's Medicare for all whether it's UBI, whether it's a Green New Deal, whether it's Fight for 15, and many, many others. We have the monopoly. We have the power. We just have to keep working at it within the establishment, and we still have to blaze that new path. So that's that's trying that's where I'm trying to conceptualize here. So it's uh, threading that needle of, of working, as you said, multi-pronged, but um, also understanding – that, as you said, we, we have the market co- corner on the market in terms of great ideas. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a question of are we strategizing wisely uh, to ultimately win the day to get those in, into place? And you are arguing about at least with Biden, we have some leverage. With Trump, we have nothing. And in fact, you know, he's exactly. going to go in and destroy everything, <laughs> you know, like he's already right. taken funding out of the EPA. He's destroyed public schools. You know, he's. He does. He's taking money out of climate change initiatives, out of Paris Accord. So I mean, it's just over three years, and he's changed the texture of the Supreme Court justice. So I agree with you. We need to rethink, and also have more open discussions rather than it's my way or the highway. You know, like there isn't just one form of UBI, yeah. right? So we need right. to all sit down at the table and understand we're all on the same team here. You know, and we have the power, like you said. I think the problem is. We have miscalculated how to use that power, and it's completely blowing up in our face, and we become really our own worst enemy. How can we start to encourage this kind of dialogue across left social media that seems to be dominated by clickbait of just always hating on the DNC and just completely on repeat about all all these problems that everybody already knows exist, but they're just stuck on that part of the record? Yeah, I I know what you're talking about. Like I see him. Uh, the same Twitter handles bringing up the same old things, the same old Hillary nonsense, the the same old divisiveness, the same as, uh, you know, we can't work with Joe and, you know, he's not going to capitulate to the left. He's not going to 
do anything. This this all in or nothing thinking. I think we have to get get away from all in, you know, like all or nothing thinking, which 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 encompasses these people uh, on Twitter, you know, and in the political world on the left. And it has to be a more nuanced conversation. We have to oh, stay absolutely. involved. Absolutely, we just I, agree with that. I just don't. We have to keep staying involved, and that's that's the thing they don't want to do because they have too much pride. They say, "Well, they're not going to help me. They're not going to, uh, you know, capitulate to me. They're not going to do what I want." So I'm saying, "Screw it. Screw the establishment." And it's self defeating, as you were saying. Like <laughs> the left does that the best. Yeah, it's uh, like I like what you were talking about, nuanced, and and the other term that comes to mind is conflation of how the left tends to conflate the the current mutation of the modern day Republican that is completely dark age traditionalist more than they are conservatives, and they equate that with the modern day uh, Democrats, and they don't consider that Obama and Biden, despite having some horrific policies, for example, you know, the war policy or the drones and things like that and taking money, you know, from lobbyists and so forth and big money. Outside of that, if you look at the record, they accomplished quite a bit. And I think that left social media doesn't give them credit and they're not balanced in their discussion and they just go to conflation right away because I think it gets lots of views. It gets, you know, clickbaits, gets lots of subscribers. You know, people can tune into that. They can tune into – they love to hear about, like, com- the complaints, but they don't want to spend the time, okay, so what's the solution now? Let's get to the to the meat of the, meat of the like, discussion about what do we need to do about it and how do we strategize to, to win. Yeah, it's that lack of nuanced thinking, though, or that lack of just reasoning honestly, actually, because they just look at, you know, what, he, what they failed at, and they have failed at things, you know, for sure. Uh, but that's not the whole story. And what Biden can accomplish is going to be much better for the left than Trump could ever accomplish. Absolutely. Like, I, I can't get over that, how so many people on the left really just, you know, there's a couple things that Obama Biden did that they hate. And then it's like, OK, that's it. We're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're not going to reason here. It's done. All in line with that. And it also doesn't lead to the ultimate outcomes that we want because, for example, you know, I understand people want to get out of these senseless wars. I understand people want to get, you know, money out of politics. But if you look at uh, the nuance of Obama and Biden's administration, Obama and a Biden campaign against Citizens United, Obama appointed two Supreme Court justices that voted against Citizens United. So they want that too. It's just that they're going about it. In a way that is more on the ground, on the floor, boots on the ground, because they're going up against the GOP, right, who don't want those things. And so they have to play dirty politics. It's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. And if they don't have the money to fight that apparatus, then they're going to be at a major disadvantage. So I don't buy this idea that just because you take dark money, it means, therefore, you're not going to work get to overturn Citizens United. Uh, I think that it's easier to believe someone that does uh, not take dark money is more likely not to be beholden to these industries or whatnot, but it doesn't necessarily always equal that. Right. It just like it just increases the odds that they won't. Exactly. And I also think that in some senses it might even increase the odds that they can achieve that because they've got the funding to do strategy and campaigning and, you know, get elected and get the justices on the Supreme Court to overturn something like this or get a bill through Congress. So those are just some things that people don't talk about. And most people don't, aren't even aware because left social media does never discuss that or bring that up or give them any credit for any good they've done. Only the bad, the bad, the bad, the bad. Right, yeah. And then <laughs> it's just, I mean, they're not willing to take uh, a healthier path here, which is we can't do another four years of Trump. It, it just, it just, it's ready to fall through the floor. I just don't, it's not even worrying. Like we're looking at it. We're watching it. We're exactly. watching American fascism rise to the top. And what would a Trump admin, uh, like another four years of Trump look like to you uh, versus a Biden administration? How, how different are they? Like, like, can you emphasize 
how starkly different that would be. Well, even like like with a bite like the half measures. OK, so like we know with Biden, we're going to get incrementalism, right? Like it, it's likely going to happen. But even that is a million times better. Then going the other way with Trump, who wants to uh, – we've already lost 7 million people with uh, – 7 million people have lost health care already in Trump's first term. Mm-hmm. We know that's going to double uh, at least. Um, you know, th- There's so many other things that are just going to be exponentially worse with Trump. I would rather take the, the, the incremental change for good and build on that. Like that just makes so much sense to me because that is the situation. That is the objective situation ahead of us. You know, it's I'll take the incrementalism. I'll take the half measures over the disaster that Trump wants to purport next, whatever that is. We know it's not going to be good. Right, right. And it, it not to mention he doesn't believe in science. There's not going to be any progress on climate change. In fact, it's going to be worsened with the you know lack of regulations. He's overturning the Supreme Court. There's going to be uh, alter no COVID conservative, response. no COVID response, a continuation of his divisive rhetoric, where it, with Biden at least he's going to try to unify people regardless of their political affiliation, religion, race, whatever. Right. Yep. Now, and that's playing out even in the cities, as you're seeing the Black Lives Matter movement, and they're not getting any more than they're being labeled as problem makers. Uh, you know. oh, yeah. And Antifa has been labeled as a terrorist organization, even though nobody has been killed under Antifa. But yet, under the white supremacist or Proud Boys, we literally have a lot of people that have been like – It's literally you know, hundreds. <laughs> it's like out. in the hundreds. <laughs> So it's really topsy-turvy and has been turned upside down, and now we've got the QAnon thing going on, and that has led to more an increase under Trump of trafficking. Uh, People don't seem to understand that or realize that. What are your own thoughts about how that's playing out in the political sphere in places like Portland, like Antifa and Portland, Uh, Antifa and the Proud Boys, things of that nature? Yeah, I got a lot to say about those guys. Uh, the last couple, my, my, two of my last videos were on that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, we keep seeing the same thing repeat over and over. We keep on seeing these far right fascist factions, whether they're Proud Boys or they're uh, buddies, uh, you know, three percenters. I don't know. Like, there's a list of them. Uh, you know, they they go into Portland, they go into other towns too. They organize. They go to Insight. And I think a lot of people are missing this context. You know, we're hearing all this stuff like, oh, Antifa uh, threw something and hit uh, hit somebody with a milkshake. And, oh, my God, they're horrible. Before any of that happens, you have right-wing militias marching in there with guns, machine guns, pistols, body armor, and military fatigues provoking communities of innocent people. OK, and and then, you know, when those people in that community fight back, those right wingers are pointing the finger. Hey, look, look, they threw they threw a milkshake at me. Oh, my God. They threw they threw a can of tuna at me. I got a machine gun <laughs> on me. I provoked it. But look what they did. Look, look, look. People are missing this concept. And, and trust me, you know, the right wing media spin machines are at their peak right now. You know, Tucker Carlson, Fox News, Alex Jones, you know, Breitbart News, they can get away with this stuff now. Um, where they where they didn't have that infrastructure, they couldn't get away with this. But they can now because the spin machines are so good. They're so sturdy. They're so well funded. So th- this is just becoming a very, very big problem. And this is a small group of people. Th- th- these are very fringy small groups of people, these right-wingers, these far-right-wingers, and, you know, they, they, they don't deserve this signal boost we're giving them, but right. they have to be dealt with, and I'm glad the FBI has, has bumped them up on the terror watch list because, you know, they are more of a threat than previously thought before. So I'm glad that the FBI is actually on that now 
and they're taking the threat of white supremacy of, of uh, you know far right fascists a lot more seriously than they did before but yeah calling anti fascist fascist <laughs> i did a video about that today uh anti anti fascist like <laughs> how far down the rabbit hole do you have to get to that conclusion right right without realizing now, okay. you're a fascist <laughs> If you're an anti-anti-fascist, it's my yeah, I like. I like the way that you're contextualizing that discussion because I think that's often the piece that a lot of people miss. They just see something in, in media rest because of a snapshot, a photo, or a little video, and they assume, aha, mm-hmm. uh-huh, there they are, this Antifa instigating again, right? And there's no discussion about, well, what happened before that or uh, what's the context here? And also the fact that a good deal of the protest outcomes from all of the study and research has been done in places like Portland have uh, jailed out that the vast majority of the violence has come from false flags, you know, where you have people like coming in as though they're Antifa and they're breaking glass or put, setting something on fire or instigating, right? It's just to yep. get everything inflamed and riled up. Right. And it's uh, only 7%. I think the last figure was 93% of these protests are, are, are peaceful and about you know approximately 7% are not. And most of those are like you were talking about here. They're false flags. They're set up. Uh, they're completely fabricated. And they victim blame the people in those communities. They say, hey, look, look at what they just did, you know. So, and like I said, with the right-wing media spin machines, they can blow this up. This is a small little anthill that they're going to turn into a Mount Rushmore-sized story. And that that's the menacing part because that tells me we're in a lot of trouble. Like, if they didn't have this infrastructure, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't feel worried. But the right. fact is that they do, and I, I am, like, legit nervous about how bad this can really get. And how far it can really go with so many yeah. neighbors out there. Yeah, and most definitely we want to give the, out the wrong impression here because we're not suggesting that there aren't some people that are uh, with Fantifa or whatever that might not be violent or might not have done some this or that. But on the whole is what we're discussing here, right, that uh, the ones that are really propagating this and, uh, you know, that are uh, instigating and false flags is coming from – uh, you know, that the, the far right. So I wanted to ask you, though, I haven't been following it as closely as you have, maybe uh, from what you've said. Um, what is going on on the floor uh, from your perspective, from what you've seen? Is it just a media thing that the police are tending to side with the Proud Boys and, and, and groups like that? Or is that just spin? As far as you know, um, I think I'm leaning on the side of that being very real. Uh, they did it in Wisconsin. They actively organized with with Kyle Rittenhouse, the guy who shot three people and killed two, right. uh, and, and other. There's video of them coordinating uh, tactical uh, positions, and I've seen that in Portland. And I've seen that in uh, Kenosha videos. Uh, So, no, I think that's valid. I'm really thinking that's valid, that these right-wing militias are siding with the cops and and vice versa, and they're playing off each other, and they're organizing uh, together. Okay, and and, and their end goal uh, is what, essentially to snuff out the Black Lives Matter movement, or is it some other larger agenda, or is it both? I mean, like, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's a good question, and there's so much vagueness in it. Like, I really can't even venture a guess. All I know is that it's not a good outcome. (laughs) Whatever it is, whatever they're plotting, whatever, how they're doing it, whatever, whatever it is, far right-wing militia is going to be a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the impression I get is uh, this has been going on – like, I I feel like the – uh, right is very good at playing controlled opposition, and they're willing to play dirty. And I really think that, you know, like the right wing, uh, far right, has estimated that Black Lives Matter has been helping the left initially. Uh, and perhaps they're wanting to go in and dirty that up, right? Uh, and anything that the left generally does 
they tend to go in and figure out ways to create controlled opposition and dirty us up. And that's the other thing. On top of that, if we didn't have enough obstacles, then the left social media comes along and dirties us up our own image. You know, <laughs> this is what we're up against, right? I know, yeah, it's like a, it's like it's stacked on top of each other. What's in front of us and defeating us, like it's feels hopeless right. some days. Yeah, it does. And sometimes I've even questioned some of the left social media, like how much of that is controlled opposition as well. So we have to be very mindful. Uh, I think that when we will know, like for me, I have a lot of respect for channels like David Pakman because I feel like he's very sensible uh, and he talks yep. strategy. And, and that lets you know that he has he's really invested in making sure that we know what it takes to win. Uh, where some of these other channels just bad mouthing the the Democratic Party all the time, and we need to you know unplug and you know all of that to me doesn't really ultimately lead to the outcomes that we we share together, and it could yeah, just right. be controlled opposition. Um, now you were also talking, uh, Dave and I were talking online offline. Like, do you feel like Trump, if he were reelected, would uh, actually go in and demolish things like Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security? Yes. Yeah, he even said it. Like He's on tape doing it. Anyone can Google it. Uh, it's on a Washington Post article. It's like a less than a two-minute video where he said he planned, like, you know, like he temporarily he's, uh, what's, the, what's the tax again? The enrollment? Is it the enrollment tax? Yeah, I think it's the, uh, something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't remember yeah, specifically, but I know what you're referring tax, to. That might be it. I can't think of it. Uh, it's the tax that pays for Medicare. Okay, so it's like canceled right now. Like you signed some legislation to put a little bit of money in everyone's pocket who's suffering through the pandemic. And he something said, like if I am reelected. $200 or something like two or $300 for seniors or something. I, I can't remember. It's a one-time thing. Yeah, it was to, yeah, it's supposed to give people a boost during this pandemic. And, you know, I guess people are agreeable to it right now because it's like, you just give me something, right? Uh, uh, the payroll tax. That's it, the payroll tax. Okay. Uh, so he said, okay, we're going to stop the payroll tax. Uh, and then if I get reelected, we're going to permanently cancel the payroll tax. He said it verbally. Now, Trump talks off the cuff. But at the same time, we shouldn't have to disseminate that. If he said it, he said it. We should take him at his word. Uh, right, so right. he's already verbalized it. You know, Republicans have been wanting to cut Medicare uh, out of the government completely, you know, privatize it, destroy it. Um, so he just signaled to them openly, we're going to take away Medicare. Yeah. And uh, not to mention, of course, he doesn't really have a health care plan. <laughs> I mean, he keeps touting like this idea that uh, Obama didn't already have, uh, you know, pre-existing conditions coverage already in it. And he's trying to take credit for it now. I mean, it's just really mind blowing. Yeah, he has nothing. He just keeps pun he just keeps punting. He keeps kicking the ball down the road. And if anyone can't see that, I. I <laughs> You don't have any good instincts at all. It's just he has nothing. He doesn't plan on having anything. The Republicans want health care in the private sector. End of story. You know, they want to destroy Social Security. End of story. Um, right. So right. you have and also, a, you have so many valid reasons to vote against Donald Trump for the guy right, who right. can actually beat him, which is Joe Biden. There's just mm -hmm. a litany of reasons why. And also, I know I want to dismantle sort of a myth that's been out there, uh, and that is that, you know, he's better on foreign policy than, than Biden or would be, uh, because right now we're currently in the same number of wars. He's dropped more drones and killed more people in three years than happened under Biden and Obama. Uh, he's now putting more troops. He's sending more troops to Syria. Even though he pulled 1,000 or so out of Afghanistan, he's doing a sleight of hand uh, and putting more troops in Syria quietly under the rug. Um, he's basically destroyed our relationships with our allies. Uh, he has provocated war with Iran, and if that would be the mother of all wars. Uh, and now they're actually creating nu nuclear weapons. Uh, where the, as before they were not. So this whole idea, and on top of that, and I have to emphasize this before I forget, and that is he actually put in trillions of dollars for new, new nuclear warheads, and he, he got rid of 
a program with Russia called the de-escalation uh, treaty, which had been in place for decades. And now for the first time, he actually took some public lands uh, and it's no longer covered. And he's specifically using it to test new uh, new heads that has not happened in decades. So if you call that a peace president, <laughs> I mean, I've got <laughs> you like a bridge I want to sell you for like a, a trillion dollars. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I here's the thing. I, I think as lefties, we're 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 gonna lose on foreign policy with either of them. But I I definitely think right, Biden right. once again would be better. Um, like even Obama and Biden had the Iran deal, which I thought was really good and sound. And of course, Trump took us out of that, destabilized that situation. So, I mean, but but I think overall. All in all, we're going to lose on foreign policy right. if we have Biden or Trump, and, and and I just know that, and I don't I don't have have much to say about it. But I think Biden would have a better chance of being more stable uh, with decision making, just in general. Agree with you. But we're going to lose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I, I definitely don't want to like pretend with Biden like he's going to be this, you know, like great, <laughs> great sweeping peace president right um what i do want to say however is that uh if anyone has this notion that a president can go in and dismantle the military industrial complex they need to wake up uh it's been tried by presidents uh, we could even argue some of them have been killed for it um so it's going to take uh, uh, you know, like American people um, prioritizing it more, coming to, you know, demand that it change along with changing. More important than I would say the president is changing the Senate that authorizes war um, and demands president follow the Constitution. If we don't have that apparatus in place uh, and it reflects, you know, um, the kind of policies you want foreign policy wise in the Senate. It doesn't matter who's president. It wouldn't even matter if it's Tulsi Gabbard, for that matter. So, um, now, uh, is there anything I should like to cover? We're about thirty something minutes here, so we definitely have, you know, a good fifteen minutes or so. If you 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 got something else you'd like to to bring up, but we we swept yeah. through that pretty rapidly. Yeah, no, that was that was pretty. That was good. It was real punchy, like boom, boom, boom. Uh, yeah, I don't, I. Uh, you know, there is something if you have I, else to talk about. We can try anything else. I mean, and, yeah, uh, there is something. Um, I did want to bring up the up uh, the the um the Supreme Court, uh, and emphasize that and your thoughts on this appointment that Trump is trying to push, as well as um how that might play out should he be successful. Yeah, I mean, uh, I still. Oh, I've been thinking about this, and I really don't have any conclusions. I, I've just been speculating. Um, if if this person, this woman, does get you know nominated and approved, I, I'm thinking about the play afterwards because I honestly believe she's going to get approved. I believe the Democrats are going to stand down. They're not going to try to do anything in their wheelhouse to try to stop it or delay it at all. They're going to grandstand at us as they always do. And they're going to get this person approved. I believe the GOP has the votes. It's likely going to happen. It's a good chance it's going to happen. So I've already like just come to terms with that right there mostly, that it's likely going to happen. So the move is afterwards. What's going to happen afterwards? Okay, if, if, it, if this is a blue wave blowout in you know 2020 November elections – you know, it, it, the, the word supermajority is popping up in my head. Like, okay, supermajority means we can wield a lot of power, and that means we could also expand the courts. So I'm that's where I'm at. I'm thinking mm -hmm. hopefully we get a supermajority, and we're going to expand the court, you know, to what, 11, 13, mm -hmm. 335? I don't know. Who cares? But <laughs> there's nothing in the Constitution that prevents this from happening. All right. Uh, there's no there's no language in the Constitution that says we need to have a specific number of judges. So th th there's a green light to get this done if the political will is there. So I believe this woman's likely going to get approved. It'll be a six three vote in in the GOP's favor, and there's no other choice. Right. To, to, 
just to expand the courts. That's that's all I got for this. What about you? Yeah, yeah, I think you said it really nicely. It's, um, you know, a 6-3 court is not only imbalanced, but it also does not at all reflect what the major- how the majority of people think values-wise. Uh, you, you know, it's just... Uh, just just wrong in every sense of the word. Um, but I, I'm in agreement with you. You know, term limits come to mind. Um, expanding the court is is definitely on the table. And uh, these are about traditions. They're not about breaking any laws. Uh, we can certainly breach that discussion, especially, as you said, if the American people are behind it. And I think that a lot of, uh, you know, a good portion of American people would likely be behind something like that because – uh, it just makes sense all around, you know, like why rely on nine people and have to hold your breath every time there's an election, you know, <laughs> it's oh, just, right. just, it's just asinine. Um, and I, now, yeah, I see a lot of, I think people are willing to see how it, this is nothing more than a power grab on the GOP. And it even, you know, it, it turns the stomachs of even conservatives because they know there needs to be something of a balance, whether what side of pol- the political spectrum you're on. It just can't be a power grab, a malicious power grab. It's not going to sit well. I mean, they can do it, but it's not going to sit well uh, with the populace. So, I mean, expanding the courts is on the horizon. I just see it. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, about the upcoming first debate this Tuesday between Biden and Trump? Um, any recommendations? What are you expecting? Uh, what outcome are you also expecting? Uh, popcorn and whiskey. I would say <laughs> <laughs> so about uh, it's going to I think it's going to be entertaining. Like, I, I really think, yeah, you, you know, these guys are really going to get dirty. I think Biden will, too. And I think I don't know. I <laughs> I think Biden is going to snap at him a lot. I think, you know, Trump's going to just he's going to fight. You know, he's going to be Trump. But I think Biden's going to fight back. And I think he's going to surprise some people like I think Biden's in debate, like historically, Biden has been a good debater. Now, there's questions about his mental health, his cognitive health and whatnot, and they seem to have him stabilized on something. <laughs> like, like I don't know if he's taking some vitamins or some caffeine pills. or He seems to have gotten a little bit more coherent and cogent in his arguments since the primary. Maybe that's just me, but he does seem a little bit sharper. And it's like, I, I think that's where Biden has thrived in the past and i hope he has something in the tank you know to show up to trump and just show that old feisty you know blue collar like spirit that he always you know exactly scrappy so i hope he has yeah um i I think you're right yeah i'm i i think that it's uh i think you hit it on the nail like the only thing that would potentially go against biden because uh, everybody already probably anticipates and expects that he's going to have a gaffe or two. Um, but I think you're right. People are going to want to see sort of that uh, notion out there that maybe he's borderline mentally incapable of being president, right? right? And and so I think that's going to be – people want to feel they have a strong leader, right? Uh, and rather right or wrong, um, they at least – perceive uh, the vast majority of American people perceive Trump as a strong leader um, and so that that I think would be Trump, Trump's card if you will and if Biden can break that notion I think it's it's a done deal I think he, he'll he will be in the driver's seat to win this um, so uh, and now going further like how do you see that sort of playing out I mean right now we're five weeks before the election and Biden is ahead nationally, about 6.8%. Uh, he's, he's slipping in Arizona, uh, North Carolina, and Florida, but gaining some ground in Georgia and Texas. What are your thoughts? Oh, man. He's got to come off like a populist. Um, like, I don't, I, I don't know how far the needle gets moved with these debates before an election. I, I, I'm just not too keen on how those polls get affected, but I think he's going to have to match the, the fever pitch of fake populism from Trump, because we all know Trump is a fake populist, but he has the rhetoric down. He has the vernacular of a right-wing populist, so he kind of has to match that, in my opinion. 
um, and be the more reasonable one, obviously. And I think he'll naturally just land that uh, without even trying because, Jesus God, Trump's a mess. <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I totally – Totally agree with you. Um, he's definitely got the, you know, like the logical, the the one that is well mannered, uh, sensible, uh, even killed, even tempered, all of that. Even though Biden has its moments, like you see, he snaps here and there. Uh, he can seeming uh, disgruntled at times, or even senile at times. Uh, on the whole, you're right. I think that he has the upper hand in terms of just coming across. Uh, more sensible and rational of the two um right. in the long term it, sorry oh no i was gonna say he can't take anything for granted because i think hillary got too comfortable they're like hey right, look right. at this crazy guy oh my god this exactly. is so good for me you know he can't really be it he really has to get in there right. and, and he really does have to debate he really does have to show some passion he does have to show that he is for the people like Trump is presenting himself for the people. Absolutely. Uh, so it's like you cannot take Trump for granted just because we know he's a lunatic, just because we know he lies all the time. Uh, whatever Trump does connects in his verbiage. It just connects. So it's like – Yeah, he's very good at, uh, at appealing to the gut, gut of America, right? Like a good part of America. He knows how to spin things to, you know, like – you know, like have people sort of like resonate with his message on a oh, sort of gut level. He's the best car salesman in America. Right, right. <laughs> it, 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 people just sort of lose their mental, logical, you know, like part of their brain and they just sort of go limbic. Uh, but anyway, um, but I was going to comment because you had mentioned earlier how you were thinking about like how much do these debates actually move the meter, right? And it turns out that. You're right. Um, in most cases, it doesn't really change it that much on the whole, like uh, one or two percent on average. And um, but the caveat is that a major gaffe can change it overnight. And, and one example okay. of that is with um, I think it was Dan Quayle, not Dan Quayle. Um, can't remember his name. Dukakis, that's who it is. And and uh, George Bush, the senior. And there's something about abortion. I can't. I I, I don't recall, but um, that led to he was ahead in the polls, like by several points. And then after oh, that debate, points Dukakis was, I think. Was it? So at yeah, one it was time, done. Was point ahead. It was done after that. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things going in I think Biden's favor. Uh, one. Is I think that that happened back in like July of August of that election year, whereas now we're in we're going to be in September October, so there's a lot less time for Trump to like try to erode Biden's lead. Um, not saying that he's that ahead; he's not that greatly ahead. I think something above ten would be far more comfortable. He's more like around seven, uh, so it's not impossible. Um, but he still needs some time to do that, right? Um, that's the first one. And the second one I think that favors Biden is I think Biden is a lot more nuanced about how he, he he's much better at not allowing someone to put him into the corner. Like he, he knows how to get himself out of that, you know, whereas Dukakis, I, just from what I remember from seeing video clips, um, it seemed like he was a lot more put in the corner and he he was on the defensive. So that's what I'm saying. I, I think Biden's really good at playing the offensive game. He doesn't tend to allow people. He knows how to not allow people to put him in the defensive mode. So I think that's also also going to favor him. Yeah, that's interesting because because when you think of Trump, he he's nothing but offense. <laughs> it's just right. like he just plays strict offense. It's like smash mouth offense. So if he can like you know Biden has the you know the edge here because he's been in 50 years worth of debates in his political career. He has to figure out a way to put Donald Trump in a corner. I don't know if that's possible because Donald Trump is like the Kool-Aid man busting through wall after wall after wall. It doesn't matter. You know, it's just like – but maybe Biden could be the guy. Who knows if he's that sharp still. Let's hope he is. Yeah, I, I think mainly what he'll need to do is he has got to uh, expose Trump as a fraud. Um, you know, like remind everybody all the promises he made, uh, how he didn't keep it. 
you know, like 90% of them, uh, his failure time after time after time on different things like COVID-19, et cetera, right? This whole idea about going after him, he's a racist or he's this or that, you know, I don't think those captivate the American public. Yeah, they just don't land. So he's got to, like, talk about results, you know, like the real substantive thing, you know, the numbers, the math, and people, it's undeniable. It's daring them in the face. It's like, 220 you know half a million quarter of a million people have died of COVID-19 and it's there's no end in sight you know or whatnot you know like his complete unmitted all the things he said on media and how he uh completely like lies and it he, he he's talking out of two sides of the mouth that kind of thing just expose him for who he is right Which and is especially a, on COVID-19 yeah, and he's a total fraud. And he, if we have him on tape saying he's gonna, down, he wanted to downplay, uh, you know, COVID nineteen. He needs just to bring up these objective things that that is reviewable to the public. You know, it's just yeah, not right. offhanded stuff. Uh, right. Because this, the failure of COVID nineteen and our lack of a federal response is merit enough to to, to vote this guy out if you're not even a political person. You know what I mean? Like. Right. It's objectively clear that he failed and doesn't plan on having in a second term a federal level response to COVID nineteen. Oh, of course, he's he going to leave it up to the states. It's it's a herd immunity is is his his uh, policy, and um, I saw it's estimates, good. yeah, that there were going to be uh, close to six million people that would die from that um, over the course of like four years, and you know Biden needs to step in and say, hey, I guess there's more than one way to kill six million people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Get, get people to you think. Know. Get people to think that Trump is responsible for a future genocide. It's already started. Look, the nineteen eighteen uh, flu pandemic had, I think it was over just over six hundred six hundred thousand six hundred fifty thousand Americans. Right. We're already right. one third of the way there. What's yeah, it going to look like after another, you know, two to four years? We're going to surpass the nineteen eighteen pandemic. So. If he can bring those historical perspectives in, that would be meaningful too. I think he should, you know, contrast that. Yeah, and I'd just add finally on that is uh, Biden needs to make it very clear that Trump's way of doing it isn't the only alternative and definitely not the best alternative. Like he needs to present that this COVID-19 is intimately tied into the economy. We don't have to choose both. Uh we can choose a pathway that will keep the economy strong and also keep you safe. Whereas right. Trump wants to give you the illusion that, you know, we do the economy and you're unsafe, but oh well, deal. You know? Right. We have to die for the economy. <laughs> That's basically what Trump exactly. is taking the approach, right? Exactly. It, yeah, if he can, thing, if it, it, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. One more thing like the, um, oh my God, I forgot. Uh, Wait. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Biden and Obama, you know, they're eight years. They actually, Biden can bring this to the debate. He can bring to the debate that he has um, uh, experience with H1N1 back in 2009, right. 2010, and also with the Ebola crisis in, I think it was 2014. Uh, mm-hmm. Like he has experience in these epidemic suppressions. So, we know H1N1 never reached our shores in, tw- in 2009. We know that the Ebola virus didn't reach our shores in 2014. That's called leverage. That's experience. He can wield that. That's objectively clear because we all, most of us live through those years. So it's like, uh, you know, just, just these clear points right. of right. reference, you know, he can win the day. Exactly. I think the bottom line here is... Biden has to find a way to ungaslight people. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, right. That it's, because we've just gone into a different place, you know, like just un, it's, unreal. So, it, yeah, it, it's it's you know anti intellectualism. It's deep down the rabbit hole, pathological lying. It's just we're so far down that rabbit hole right now. It's looking grim. Yeah, I mean, I do think that. Uh, a good part of the left and many Americans don't fully appreciate the gravity of the the time we're in and right. also what we're up against. Uh, there, you know, like 
John, uh, Noam Chomsky had said that the most dangerous organization on the face of the earth is the modern day GOP. Uh, and we don't, people don't seem to recognize that. They don't seem to understand. I would argue the DNC, while somewhat lackluster on many of the policies, I think a good deal of why they are that way is because of the current um, pre-mutation of the GOP as it exists today. Uh, so get that out of the way. I think the DNC is going to be easy. I, I really do. I think it'll be really easy to get get them toward our agenda. Well, yeah, Just it's only a matter of time of because all the all the things that progressive support is like on on timetables and and you know data. Uh, you know, there's resourceful data that backs up why these policies are needed, why they need implemented. It's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of, you know, will they or won't they? They will, and they will in time. We just have to make it as happen. As long to... as we can get the, the, the fascists out and the modern day GOP, like uh, the far right, you know, which happens to be the majority, unfortunately. Uh, once we get that out of the way, I think that the, the road is open, and I think, as you said, it's inevitable. Right. It's just a matter of time. Like I said in the beginning of, the, of our chat here today, which has been great, uh, like you know, it's we have a monopoly on the most popular policies in the zeitgeist right now as progressives. So we're going to – that power will manifest and rise to the top as time goes by. Just a matter of time. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. Well, that's a great way to end this discussion, Dave. This has been absolutely awesome, and I know that everybody out there is delighted They've, that's been following Progressive Talk podcast. Uh, so we'll be doing some more in the future. Uh, so thanks for coming on, Dave. Thank you, Josh. It's been great talking with you. Again. You too.